Okay. I'm Niels Waarijs. Uh, like uh, Fitz said, I'm a member of Tool, the open organization of lock pickers. We open locks for sports, not for a living, as some of us do. And I'm also a member of the hackerspace in Arnhem called Hack42. And uh, I think that's an awesome hackerspace. I've never been here before, so I like it also. Uh, we're we're blurred and Google Earth, so we're that awesome. Um, we're going to talk about impressioning, and uh, I will explain what impressioning is, but it is opening locks, and before we can open the lock, I have to explain it very briefly. Basics, what is a lock, and why can we open it, is either by picking or by impressioning it. Because impressioning it uh, basically uses the same flaws in the lock that we use with picking. If we look at A-lock, this is A-lock. Um, this is a Euro profile lock, me being from Europe, I take that as, uh, as credit. Um, and for you guys, it probably mounted upside down. And the form is different, but the idea remains the same. That we have a circle that needs to turn, and if that turns, we as sports pickers consider it open. A locksmith might not consider it open because it has to turn the right way. Um, but as a sport, that's enough. Schematically, it looks like this. We see a round thingy, and there's something in there that probably is a reason why we can't turn it. So we can't see that much here, so if you take one layer deeper, so MRI it basically, then we come up with this. So we see that there's not just a red bit, there's a blue bit. And actually the blue bit is preventing the big yellow circle from turning. And there's a spring underneath it, in the American standards that would be upside down, uh, the helpful part in America is that if that spring is not there, gravity is helping. So in Europe, we actually need that spring. So if we try to turn this, um, it won't turn, because it's blue bit in the way. It makes perfectly sense. And if you want to turn this, that blue bit has to get off. So get out of the way. So if we push that thing down, it'll turn. But a lock is not normally five, uh, one pin, but either five or six or three, whatever. It's a multi -pin. So now we see five blue bits preventing this cylinder from turning. And the only way to make that uh, cylinder turn is to push all those pin stacks to the correct depth. For that we need a special tool called a key. And if you put that in, you see that this line, it's called the shear line, that all the pins are at the correct level so it can turn. Basic lock operations. And even if it's off just one depth, this is too deep, that's too high, it won't turn, because then there's a blue bit in the way. But, um, so in the way it's designed, that if you start turning, there are five blue bits preventing it from turning. Right? We keep on explaining that. But that's the design. It's not real life, because in real life we have crap like this. You see that these are supposed to be round, but there's crap. And these are Korean pins, and they're utterly crap. But even if they're, <laughs> but even if they're made quite well, and you see here that this is supposed to be flush and supposed to be straight, because it's all machined. I mean, so in a factory, there's uh, a couple of drills, five drills that drill the holes. You have wear and tear on those drills, of course, and you can make it close to perfect, but then your lock would be stupid expensive. And for a consumer point of view, it will still be just a regular lock. So that's why it, it, it can't be perfect. And actually, uh, there are tolerances always, because you, you can't make a piece of metal to the micron exact. There's always one of the pieces, uh, one of these, that's wider than the other, if you just look close enough. So that means that if you start turning that cylinder, it's not five blue pieces preventing it from turning. It's one blue piece preventing it from turning first. Does that make sense? Because that's useful to do. Because what, so what we can do is we ju can just look at that one pin stack. And if we take that one pin stack, that's not moving, of course, because it's a blue bit in the way. And if we put that down, you see this before, that it can turn but ever so slightly. If it turns with some luck, the blue bit will stick at this, that ledge, and it'll turn ever so slightly until the next blue bit is preventing it from turning. We can use that to pick a lock. Because what we can do now is take a cylinder, put some turning tension on it, some turning force on it, so 
a uh, blue bit will prevent it from turning. And if you go in with your feeler pick, you can feel, let's start this over again. So if you go in, and you go in with your, with your pick, you, this is just spring, that's just a spring, that's just a spring. That doesn't want to go down because it's squashed to the side. The one that doesn't want to go, you push down. So the more force it gives you back, that's the one you want to push down. And then you just keep on feeling until everything's there and then it opens. That's basic lock picking. So we're making use of the tolerances in your lock. Okay, so now impressioning, which is different-ish, but same-ish also. <laughs> this is not new. I mean, this is uh, at Tickle, and uh, I used to give this lecture and then say, if anybody knows this guy, hook up with him, because I really want to pick his brain. And then somebody did hook up with me, and that was his son, declaring that his dad was dead. And he never got uh, to learn this technique from him, and he asked me if, if I could teach him. So that's what we did in LA last, that was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was this year. It was this year, okay, time flies. And um, so the story is, Ed would uh, put impression locks. Because if I teach you how to pick a lock, you might open a lock, right? That's the idea. But if you are a FBI, CIA agent, you have to go in somewhere and there's guards that keep on showing up. You can't half pick a lock. Well, you can half pick a lock, but if you step away, you have to start all over again. So that's, you can't half do it. And if you come back the next day and you didn't pick it the first day, you have to again pick it. So what they can, well, they didn't come up with this whole technique, but this technique, uh, if you are good at it, you end up with a working key. So what they can do, what the agency can do, they send the, the lock guy in to do his stuff and he ends up with a key. And of course a key you can give to another operator. Because they know how to operate a key. And he can go in and out and in and out. So once you, have, once you do this attack, you own the lock forever. You don't need any skills anymore because you have a working lock. And what they did with that, uh, one of his first assignments, that was a, 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 a mob place that they had to go in. So the night before, they took a big cardboard box, like uh, for, for a freezer or something like that, and they put it night, right next to the, 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 the mob guy's door. And they put a hole, a hole in the cardboard, and he went out with his tools, and right there on the spot, he made his lock. Which is scary, but that's what he did. Okay, impression. The question is, how long can I stand in front of your server room or any other board room without being questioned, arrested, shot, or whatever? <laughs> is that two seconds? I probably can't be there for two seconds without running into trouble. A minute? Can I be at your server room door for a minute without being questioned? Ten minutes? I think if I can stand ten minutes in front of your server room door without being questioned, you have other problems. <laughs> but, uh, that would be wrong. But one of the answer, but one of the questions is two seconds. Because we said two seconds, now you're probably not gonna get questions within two seconds. But if I take that two seconds twice a day for about a week, so that's ten to fourteen instances, well depends on your working days, um, will I get questions? I think in bulk of the instances that would not be the case. Would you agree? So, this technique makes it possible to, um, to divide your attack in tiny little steps, tiny little increments. And I only need two seconds at the door per iteration. So, if you're in a high-valued high uh, uh, facility, this is something to keep in mind. Because anyone wondering uh, in the hallway, is this one? Oh, that's not my door. That could be enough for that one instant. Okay, so how does it actually happen? Uh, same schematics, we have a lock, but now we put a uh, blank key in. And instead of the blue bits preventing the, the, the cylinder from turning, now of course, because there's a hunk of metal in, in the middle, it's the red bits that are preventing it from turning. But same applies if we start turning this, there is one red bit preventing it from turning first. Same or same, no rocket science. But a lock has tolerances. 
So you can, if you put a key in, you can move it up and down a bit. There is room to wiggle, just a bit. You need a room, because if it would be a perfect fit, it's quite impossible, well, it's not impossible, but it's very hard to put your key in, because there's no, there's no room to get. And especially if you're half drunk, or whatever, that's not going to happen, so there, there will be room to move it up and down. So what you can do now is put the key in, and of course you can put it up and down, and of course you can turn the key to the other side, to the other side, with some luck, there's another red bit preventing it from turning, and then you put the key up and down. Because if you look at position 1, 3, and 5, we count from the shoulder, so that's 1, 3, and 5. The only thing that this key is doing is basically pressing the springs, right? There's nothing else preventing it from moving up and down. But if you're moving one way and that pin is not wanting to move because it's stuck with the side, and you put your key up and down, that key is being pressed by that pin. If you do that with enough force, not with too much, but with enough force, there will be dents in your keys. Tiny scratches, tiny dents. They're hard to see, so that's actually quite lifelike, because there's one and there's one. And in real life they look a bit like this, but you'll see that later. And what you do at the spots where those uh, where the spots are, you take off ever so ever